Great. OK, so um, yeah. So thanks for helping me get set up. Um, and I'm glad to talk to you today about, uh, the title says Stellar Explosion Mechanics, but that's, don't let that mislead you. It's just kind of a walk through how, how to think about the interiors of white dwarf stars and um, how we put those pieces together when we do simulations to blow them up. And I will uh, briefly motivate why this is done in the first place. So, oh. Oh. Yeah. Ah, okay. Okay. Well, fumbling around anyone listening, I gave them an earful, I'm afraid. But, um, right, okay. So, so the, the, whole, the whole motivation for this is type 1a supernova. And in the context of 1a supernova, the white dwarfs become interesting. If you didn't already think so, then hopefully I'll convince you of that. Um, do I have a laser pointer? No. Yeah, here we go. Uh, this is Supernova 1994D. I've, uh, apologies if I've shown this picture before to some of you, but um, this was, show everybody shows this picture, yes. This, <laughs> uh, the reason that people like this picture is because it, it demonstrates something that, um, where this is a 1A supernova, and I'll mention what that is in a little bit, but you see it here next to its host galaxy, and this demonstrates that um, the, during the peak luminosity phase of a 1A supernova, it can emit just as much luminosity as the host galaxy that it's in, which means we can see it from very far away. And the usefulness of that is that um, you can observe this from very far away and measure how, what it, how its luminosity changes with time. And so if you do that for a bunch of supernova and you line up all of their peak luminosities up in, on the time axis, you get a plot like this. And uh, dots here are measurements of luminosities and um, the solid lines are uh, fits to these measurements. And so the useful thing about this is that you see they all look about the same shape. Um, but you can also see that uh, the brighter events here are also a little bit wider. And so um, that, allows, uh, that allows observers to correct these and fit them all to the same basic template. And so this is correcting for the, the stretch factor, which determines how broad it is. Um, and they, they can all fit on the same uh, curve. The reason for this is that... Um, they're, the luminosity is powered by nickel-56 decay. Nickel-56 is synthesized in the, uh, in the nucleosynthesis that powers the supernova explosion itself. And uh, the decay products of this nickel-56 not only give you um, optical luminosity, but they also determine uh, the optical thickness of the ejecta. And so that correlates the luminosity in this decay time. Um, so, from a long time ago, these events were identified with the explosion of about a solar mass of carbon and oxygen under degenerate conditions, and I'll mention what that means in a little bit, but um, essentially you can think of the pre-explosion white dwarf as a uh, one solar mass of liquid metal composed of carbon and oxygen nuclei and electrons. Uh, just kind of floating in space and undergoing nuclear fusion. Um, yeah, so anyway, so the fact that we can standardize these all to the same template means that we can measure how far away their host galaxies are and how fast they're moving relative to us and led to the discovery of dark energy, which you see here, comprising about 70% of the universe's energy. So, um, so why is this important? And well, this is important because uh, what you're looking at here is uh, a, cur the, a curvature term in cosmology, as well as a dark energy equation of state parameter. 
Um, and you, well, you're looking at constraint curves here for different levels of uh, significance. And uh, red here is brain acoustic oscillations plus the cosmic microwave background. Um, blue here is supernova, type 1a supernova, plus the cosmic microwave background. And then green is what you get when you put uh, both of those together. So um, the interesting thing here is that uh, the contribution from supernova and the contribution from baryon acoustic oscillations is, are sort of orthogonal here, which means that you can combine them to constrain the overall dark energy equation of state parameters uh, quite well. Um, even though the supernova constraint is, uh, is much wider in parameter space. All right. So, um, yeah, that's all I'll say about that. Okay, so where do these type 1a supernova come from? Well, there are a few different models. And so um, the classic picture is that you have a white dwarf here and it's accreting matter from a companion star. And uh, as it accretes matter, it gets denser and denser, and its central temperature increases uh, because it's supported by degenerate electrons. And that ignites thermonuclear fusion, which can take the form of a detonation or a deflagration um, or some combination of those and uh, disrupt the star and yield an explosion. Um, there's, so, so this would occur with a, uh, a, a roughly Chandra Sekar mass white dwarf, which is the, the maximum mass of a white dwarf that can be supported by electron degeneracy pressure. Um, if you had two of these white dwarfs, uh, you could smash them into each other, hypothetically, if there was a third star to destabilize a binary system. Uh, you could merge them inwards because uh, two white dwarfs orbiting each other are going to emit gravitational uh, wave radiation and the orbits will decay. Um, yeah, and then you can also have a single white dwarf that's lower than the Chandrasekhar mass, but if during the process of accretion uh, a detonation is ignited and it's in the helium shell surrounding the carbon-oxygen core, then, then perhaps that can cause the core to detonate. Um, so I'm going to, so that's the sort of background for what are type 1a supernova, why do we care about them, blah, blah, blah. Um, next, I want to briefly discuss the equation of state for white dwarf matter. And so uh, let's start with the lower plot. The lower plot is from a popular stellar evolution code, MESA. Um, the, some of these curves have changed just slightly in recent years, but um, it's basically the same now. So what this does is it shows a log temperature on the vertical axis, log density on the horizontal axis, and then this space is segmented into different regions for which different named equations of state uh, are used as they best characterize what the material is doing there. So a popular uh, equation of state that we use for white dwarfs is the Helmholtz equation of state, which, um, which I'll discuss up here. But, um, but that's particularly good for high temperatures and high densities. And then a small region right here. If you want uh, lower temperatures at high densities, then you have to talk about crystallization of the uh, ions in this matter. And so you can use another equation of state um, with this dashed line being the, uh, the dividing line between those. So I'll come back to that in a second. But um, so in the regime where these pre-supernova white dwarf live, that's pre-supernova meaning they're, they're heating up and carbon simmering. So their temperatures are in the ballpark of between 10 to the seventh Kelvin and 10 to the eighth Kelvin with a central density uh, typically exceeding 10 to the 8th grams per cubic centimeter, um, usually more like 10 to the 9th grams per cubic centimeter. So we're well in the Helmholtz regime. 
Um, so what does that mean? How, how should we think about it? Well, the total pressure and total energy of the, of the matter is made up of a sum of uh, pressure from ions, from photons, and from electrons and positrons. Um, and the way this works is that ions are treated as an ideal gas. Uh, photons are treated as uh, coming from a Planck black body spectrum. And the electrons and positrons um, can be arbitrarily relativistic, arbitrarily degenerate, and they're uh, Fermi gases. And they don't interact with each other. So, um, so yes, this is what we get for pressure if uh, we plot that as a function of density. And, uh, <laughs> and so, um, so, yes, if, if you have detailed questions about this, then you're in luck because Doug Swesty is here. And <laughs> um, yes. Right. Um, and what is Right. So PC, PC um, does some condensed matter physics to treat uh, like partial crystallization and stuff like that. So this is where, um, so the line that I've mentioned here, this, set, this has this capital gamma equals 175. So this is the Coulomb coupling parameter, which is the ratio of, um, it, it's intuitively speaking, the ratio of the uh, Coulomb interaction energy to the kinetic energy of the ions. And so uh, if that gets high, then the uh, Coulomb interactions between the ions are strong enough to impose order on the ionic matter. And so that's called the crystallization limit. And uh, and so this equation of state is uh, designed to treat that. So is that a packet you can get? Is it in MESA? Or is it, in it is in MESA, um, probably as a table, because I, I, I believe some of these fancy equations of state, you have to, they're very expensive. You have to <laughs> tabulate them, essentially. Um, so SCVH, um, this C is the same C as this C. I think that it's it's there. These are authors. Um, Van Horn is the is is the VH. I don't remember the C. The S is Saman. He was the one who organized the the White Dwarf Conference this summer. Yes, at Los Alamos. Yes. Um, I don't know what special physics goes into this. Um, I believe this was. Uh, the paper for this is uh, these authors published it in '95, and um, they this is the <laughs> they do some condensed matter stuff here. I'm I'm not an expert in that, so I'm not sure exactly how this differs from uh, from the other tables here. But yeah, uh, this for sure is uh, treats crystallization. Right. Um, okay. Uh, right. So let's let's carry on. Um, yeah. Okay. So next, uh, you have all of these. So previously, I mentioned you have this uh, ideal gas of ions. You have this. Um, you can think of this Planckian. Uh, distribution of photons and then these Fermi gases of electrons and positrons. And so in that picture for, um, for the vast majority of pre-supernova white dwarfs, the ions are going to be completely ionized um, to a good approximation unless you have something really heavy. Um, but there's not much of those. So it's mostly carbon and oxygen. Uh, and between the nuclei that you do have in the white dwarf, you have some thermonuclear reactions. And so the way this works is that the, if you think of a reaction that couples uh, nuclei I and J that fuse to make K, then the number change in nucleus I 
is we're taking i away, so this is a minus sign, and then we have the cross section for this interaction times the length over which the interaction takes place, which is VDT, the vo relative velocity of i and j, times uh, a differential time, um, and then times the uh, number density, sorry, times the total number of uh, nuclei i and j, because this cross section is per number of i and j. Um, so we can divide through by dt and get this in terms of a rate, and then transform it into a, a variable y, where y here is a molar abundance. Um, so this is a uh, number of nucleus i per mole of stuff. And, uh, and we can write this equation in terms of time. And in general, because the fluid is moving around too, um, it's not just changing in time, but it's changing because of fluid motion. Um, and what's typically done in, uh, in codes is to separate the fluid advection part from the species evolution from the purely time-dependent part, which is the thermonuclear reactions, and solve each one separately and switch back and forth um, between them. And so uh, this is generally known as operator splitting because then you can use hydro methods that aren't limited by the tiny time steps you have to take to solve these reaction equations. Um, okay, so all the physics is really inside this cross section. So what's done, so here in this, in this expression, this is dependent on the relative velocity of i and j, and the, thus the center of mass energy at which this interaction takes place. But what's done is that you average over these velocities using uh, a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution of velocities for nuclei i and j. And so what that looks like is this. Um, Avogadro's number times the velocity average of sigma v gives you these prefactors where this is the, the reduced mass and it's temperature dependent here in the denominator. And then it, you integrate over the center of mass energy a term like this that's basically the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution um, multiplied, multiplied by this cross-section times velocity. And the, so this is plotted here for a sample reaction, which is fusion of carbon-12 with helium-4 uh, to make oxygen-16 and emit a, a photon. And so this integrand is what is being plotted here on the vertical axis. Uh, the units here are centimeters cubed per mole per second. Um, and different curves are plotted here for different temperatures. And you can see the temperature dependence of all of this because as you go to higher and higher temperatures, you go from a very, a very uh, sort of almost Gaussian curve, which is what you would get if, um, if sigma e is, it was essentially proportional to an exponential uh, divided by the energy. And uh, if you have any nuclear structure that affects, uh, that affects the cross-section, then you get more interesting things like this, like these peaks, which occur because of resonances uh, on this oxygen nucleus. And so, um, so yeah, the, as you go to higher temperatures, more of these resonances in oxygen are accessible uh, in the fusion product. And so you get more structure to, uh, to this cross-section. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, there aren't data points here, but, but it may be constrained by experiment. I forget exactly, uh, but this is a paper that came out not too long ago this year where they did do some experimental constraints for this, uh, for this rate. And so I forget whether this is pure theory or whether it has the experimental constraints from that. Um, Yeah. 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 They have to. Yeah. None of the measurements are in the 
are in the regime of, that's the other thing, none of these measurements are in the regime of temperature that's, that's useful for astrophysics. Um, so, uh, so, which is, you know, typically sub giga Kelvin. Um, and so, uh, those center of mass energies are really difficult to get with an accelerator. It's very easy to get higher energies than that in an accelerator. And then you extrapolate to low energy. Um, uh, yeah, okay, so next. Um, we also have some neutrino processes that are going on inside the white dwarf. And so, um, and so our codes, Castro and Maestro, have, uh, have routines for calculating what the neutrino losses should be. Uh, and they can be summarized using these categories. So you can have, um, have so-called recombination neutrinos, which, <laughs> which come from a continuum electron transitioning to a bound electron state and then emitting a pair of neutrinos, or to uh, uh, fermions, an electron and a positron, uh, interacting to form two neutrinos. Or you can have a plasma neutrino, which comes from a photon that is interacting with the plasma in the white dwarf so strongly uh, that this interaction gives rise to, uh, to neutrinos. Uh, photoneutrinos, which is a positron or an electron interacting with a photon. Uh, and then you can have something interesting, neutrino bremsstrahlung, which um, you may have heard of uh, bremsstrahlung in the context of say an electron accelerating through uh, a material and then emitting photons. But in this case, instead of emitting photons, you emit neutrinos. And this is, occurs because of weak interactions on, between all of these constituents on the left-hand side that came in. Yeah? Uh, I think that's a separate process from producing a photon that produces a plasma neutrino, um, because What this looks like in terms of the energy loss rate in ergs per uh, cubic centimeter per second in log space is like this. For log, log of density divided by the mean molecular weight of the electron is here. And um, so as a ballpark figure, mu e is just two for us, basically, for symmetric nuclear matter. Um, so log of density divided by two is plotted here. Um, essentially for a white dwarf, you could think of that. Uh, and this is for t a temperature of uh, eight, uh, 10 to the 8th Kelvin. Um, N equals 2 here means uh, that there are two other species of neutrino besides electron neutrinos, basically, um, with low masses. Um, yeah, so recombination uh, is here. These, are, these results are listed in terms of various compositions. So this is iron, carbon, and helium. Um, and then you also have the sum of uh, pair production uh, photoneutrinos and plasma neutrinos here in this solid curve. Um, and then these Bremsstrahlung neutrinos plotted here, which at high density are significant. Um, it helps to look at a plot like this, where you're looking at log t and log density divided by two again. And this is segmented into uh, spaces where classified by the particular type of neutrino loss rate that is operating. 
that is dominant there. Um, this dashed line is the uh, electron Fermi temperature. That is to say, it's the uh, it's the temperature at which, if you had, um, it's consistent with the Fermi energy. If you converted the Fermi energy into a temperature, this is what you would get. Um, right, and so. Here, again, is a dashed line that shows the crystallization limit. So at temperatures below this, or at densities above this, in this range, uh, you have crystallization in the, in the white dwarf. Um, and then at temperatures above that, or densities below that, uh, Bremsstrahlung is preferable. And then you have uh, these plasma neutrinos. And at the densities of interest for white dwarfs, which is basically here down to like here, um, then we are we're right around in here somewhere. Because um, as the white dwarf heats up, it's, uh, the peak temperature can get quite high. But otherwise, we're, the plasma neutrinos are probably the most important. Um, right. So when you put all of this together, uh, when you put all of this together, uh, I showed how you get those rate equations for abundances. And the whole point, let me go back a, a bit because I forgot to mention something. The whole point of doing this is so that you can come up with a rate by which your energy changes due to these processes. So in addition to writing down an abundance rate equation, you can write down an energy rate equation, um, which, which includes the contributions from the binding energies of your nuclei and uh, these neutrino energy loss reactions. And, um, oh, and they're considered energy losses even though you get neutrinos out because the neutrinos just leave your star. Your star is transparent to neutrinos, effectively. Um, it, takes, uh, it takes neutron star type densities to really get you uh, neutrino mean free paths that are short enough to be confined. Um, OK, right, so what does this give us? This gives us, a, this gives, gives us a vector of quantities, where n is the number of variables that we integrate. Uh, it, and we can arrange them like this, where what we've determined using all these rate equations is how fast, that changes with, how fast this vector changes with time, which is this function f. And it's dependent on uh, time itself. And, uh, and this integration variable. Time itself in, is in general here. And typically, we're not actually explicit. We don't actually explicitly depend on time. But um, so for our purposes, you can think of this as being f of y. Um, right. So uh, the, the problem with nuclear reactions is that you can have some nuclear reactions that are very fast and some that are very slow. And so this gives you a stiff system of ODEs to solve. Um, and you have to use. Uh, you have to use tricks to be able to solve this efficiently. And so uh, a package that we like to use is VODE. And what it does is basically this. Um, it, at, at every step, in order to find, uh, in order to find your new uh, integration vector at, over your time step h of n, uh, your step is labeled by n here. Um, you want to solve an equation like this, where y of n depends on previous values of your integration vector uh, combined with using these constants alpha, h, and beta combined with uh, the current value of your right-hand side. And so this gives you an implicit equation because your right-hand side is, is a function that is is very complicated. It's nonlinear, and it's not possible to really extract out what y should be analytically from this. Um, so you have to uh, you have to essentially factor this, and that's done by introducing a Jacobian, uh, the which is the derivative of this with respect to y. And you get a, a matrix out of that, and so that lets you put this system into a form like this, which is the, the difference between the identity matrix and uh, uh, some factor of your Jacobian. And you say, this is equal to 0, and I want to solve for this. And that's done by doing OU factorization on this matrix. And um, that's where a lot of the work, most of the work, in actually doing the OD integration 
lies is in doing the matrix algebra there. Um, Um, so, uh, but that's what, that's, that's the, that's the point here. And the number of previous values of your integration vector that, that you put into, to this sum, uh, is determined by the order Q, and, uh, both varies that between one and five, uh, dynamically during the inter integration to, to try to do the least work and take the biggest steps, um, with the most accuracy. So. What does this look like if we go and integrate a network? Well, what you're looking at here is a network that's composed of these reactions. Um, these reactions are using rates from a, a rate library called ReactLib. Uh, these weak reactions uh, involve an electron capture onto sodium-23 to make neon-23, and then the beta decay of neon-23 to give you sodium-23 and an electron. This comes from this paper by, by Suzuki and co-authors last year. Uh, but otherwise, this is just a carbon-12 fusion, like you would have in a white dwarf that's just uh, undergoing carbon fusion in a score. So I'll mention later on why this part is interesting. But uh, the idea here is that these electron capture reactions occur at high density. These beta decays occur at low density. Um, and so what does this look like if you, what I'm showing here are results from a self-heating uh, uh, reaction network integration at constant pressure. And so this means there's no hydro. So all of the energy just stays within the material that's reacting. And uh, this serves to accelerate the, the dynamics here because what you're looking at is all this carbon fusion. And so, uh, if you look at the mass fraction of carbon-12, you see that it's, this is in log space, it's, in log space it's essentially constant and then just <laughs> there's a hard drop. And along the way you produce some of, uh, some products, which I'll mention in a second. But this hard drop is because it's self-heating. So the temperature is plotted in red here. Um, as carbon is fusing rather slowly, the temperature is building um, because we're keeping all the energy in this in this cell, essentially. You could think of this as representing a small volume inside the star. All the energy is confined there. And, um, and so the temperature rises, it just has to keep rising because we're just dumping all the energy from this carbon fusion into the material. Well, at some point, because the carbon fusion rate is so strongly dependent on temperature, <laughs> the, as the temperature increases right here, you hit like a knee. And so that jumps your carbon burning rate significantly and dumps a lot of energy into, into uh, the surrounding medium. And, and then you exhaust your carbon and there's no more energy. So uh, the sign of your energy generation flips all of a sudden. And the reason for this is because of the, this electron capture reaction. So how does this work? Well, um, it's because of this reaction. Carbon-12 plus carbon-12, which uh, about half the time, a little bit less than half the time, uh, makes a, uh, a hydrogen nucleus and sodium-23. And then this sodium-23, this is at a high enough density, so this is, this is at 2 times 10 to the ninth grams per cubic centimeter. This is a high enough density that this electron capture reaction is strongly favorable over this reverse beta decay. And so carbon-12 gives you a lot of this sodium-23. You can see in yellow the sodium-23. As carbon is fusing, um, sodium-23 is creeping up and up and up, along with neon-20 the other major product of this carbon fusion. Um, and so the, uh, the electron captures onto sodium-23 really get going when you get this spike in abundance for sodium-23 because this electron capture rate, uh, the, the rate for this is proportional to the abundance of the sodium-23. So, um, so if you jump the abundance of your sodium-23 massively here, you'll get a similar jump in the electron capture rate but you've got no more carbon-12 to expend energy. So the electron captures just go and go and go and remove energy by uh, capturing uh, degenerate electrons. <laughs> and, um, and so that, that over a long, much longer period of time uh, reduces the sodium-23 abundance um, and the temperature uh, concurrently. Um, Okay, so 
this is, I, I will mention in a second, well, in a few seconds, I guess, a few minutes, why this is interesting. But for now, this is the sort of result that you could get by integrating a reaction network that you're interested in. Um, and so in practice, this is, we combine this with, uh, with the hydro code to solve a large problem. Or we don't, because our computer freezes. But um, hmm. yeah, we'll have to take drastic measures here. Yeah, my computer froze. Um, I could, I could do the rest of it as an interpretive dance, yes. Um, oh dear, well. Oh, there we go. Uh, so, where was I? Uh, oh, here we are. Okay. Slideshow. Start not from that slide. Uh, sorry, I, the screen has to come back up. Um, There we go. Mm. Okay, not sure why my laptop froze, but hopefully it will not freeze again. Start from the slide, say. Oh, great. And of course it presented on my laptop again. Uh, <laughs> slide settings. Let's present on. Uh, Display two. Okay, um, right. So here we are. We're just here. And then we went here. All right. So um, right. So uh, so I just finished talking about what you could do, what kind what kind of physics you could get out of integrating a nuclear reaction network. Um, and I mentioned the algorithm for doing that. Uh, one of the things that I've been working on lately is um, porting that to CUDA so that we can integrate a lot of uh, zones at the same time on a GPU. So the idea for that is here. Um, this is sort of the use case for it. You have some grid of cells that represents a physical mesh. Um, over which that's and your star sits on that mesh. Well, it's spatially discretized, and at each point, uh, or at, in each cell uh, that comprises the star, you have a density and temperature and composition, and you want to evolve the reactions for some time. So, all of this sits uh, on your accessible to your CPU in your in your node memory or your, your CPU memory. And then uh, we move that to a GPU. So what you're looking at is a streaming multiprocessor on, uh, on an NVIDIA GPU. And, um, and then on this streaming multiprocessor, or on a grid of these, we loop through each one of these zones. And we loop through them in parallel. And in each zone, do the integration in a sequential way. So. Um, what that looks like is that our, in red, is our integrator, that's Vode, and it's evaluating the right-hand side and the Jacobian, 
And what feeds into that are all of the rates that we talked about, as well as the equation of state, as well as, um, as, well as screening for the rates, which I haven't talked about and, and, um, and won't for the sake of time, but the neutrino losses that we mentioned and all of that. So uh, all of this makes the right-hand side in the Jacobian a little bit expensive to calculate. And the integrator does this as it, as it steps forward in time, however much time we want. And um, because we're doing this on parallel, uh, we get some speed up that's greater than one, which is comforting. But um, this is comparing a Tesla P100 uh, GPU to a serial execution on a Power 8 CPU, which, uh, is, which is what's currently on Summit Dev at Oak Ridge. Um, and it's a, a similar setup to uh, the hardware that we see in Summit when it comes online. Um, it'll have an upgraded GPU and an upgraded CPU, but it's, it's similar. Um, so on the horizontal axis, you have the, the width of a cubic grid. So what this is doing is it's sampling um, the, de the density, temperature, and composition space along three axes of, of a grid, and then evolving the reactions for each cell in that grid where uh, the grid size is 16 cubed, 32 cubed, 64 cubed, or 128 cubed. So those are the number of zones we're, we're integrating. And for a simple uh, three species uh, carbon ignition network, this is, this is a very simple network. This carries around oxygen, but only evolves carbon uh, as, as a rate, and then puts that carbon that fuses with itself uh, into magnesium. And so, um, that's a very simple network because your, the size of your right-hand side is only three. You've got carbon, and then you've got temperature and energy um, because you can get magnesium and oxygen from how much carbon burned and saying that oxygen just makes up the difference. Um, anyway, so that's, that's a very cheap network to evaluate is the bottom line. And we get a considerable speed up out of, out of this. So for a 128 cubed grid, the speed up is like 39, which is, which is great. Um, but unfortunately, for larger networks like this nine isotope ERCA process network, which I, which I just told you about, uh, the speed up isn't nearly as good. <laughs> it's maybe 15 at best, uh, or 14. And uh, for a 13 isotope alpha chain network, where uh, that's a very stiff network, um, the speed up is a little bit worse even. Um, and the funny thing is that the reason for this is that we're essentially limited by how much uh, local thread memory the integrator requires. Um, it requires so much local thread memory that we're, we're filling up the available caches available to one particular thread on the GPU, and so um, we have to communicate with the larger memory blocks on the GPU that take more time. Um, I think that follows from the size of the Jacobian and the size of the, the right-hand side. There's an option. The size of the Jacobian is a big deal because um, that goes as the number of elements squared, of course. But um, what I, the, the fun thing I found is that Vode has an option that lets you cache the Jacobian and avoid recomputing it every time you need it um, because you can let it sit around for some number of time steps and then determine intelligently when it becomes too old to use, and then recompute it. Um, <laughs> that's the default, and it turns out that it's faster to just recompute the Jacobian every time you need it um, than to leave it sitting in memory. Um, each thread, yes, each thread has its own Jacobian, and so uh, the amount of cache that's available to a thread isn't enough to make that worth it. Um, anyway, so this is sort of ongoing work. Why did you have to move to the uh, Because, right. So we started out, um, uh, Adam Jacobs did a lot of work with OpenACC and DBDF, which is a backward differentiation uh, integrator that's very, that, the algorithm is essentially the same as what I described for Vode. Um, Vode does some fancier stuff, but the backward differentiation formula is the same, essentially. Um, 
anyway, but it uh, it's not quite as robust as Bode, and so there are cases where VBDF, VBDF fails to integrate something, and Bode will. I'm not and why you use ah, yes, the reason is the reason is that um, <laughs> right. So uh, the reason is that although we had already put some effort into getting these and other integrators to work with OpenACC, they didn't work as well as Vode, and we can't use OpenACC with Vode. Because Vode was written in like the 80s or yeah. whatever. And so the Fortran programming constructs that it used, like GoTo's, for instance, are it's full of those, and OpenACC doesn't know how to translate those properly. So it'll give you things like um, it'll it'll complain about like jumps for instance, within your program, or jumps outside of a loop, because you have go-tos that jump you out of stuff. And uh, that's something that CUDA knows how to handle, strangely. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so that's why I ported Vode to CUDA instead of continuing to beat my head on OpenACC. But yeah, that was, that was fun, because I mean, there's stuff that CUDA doesn't like that Vode did too. but. <laughs> that was sort of an exercise in Fortran. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, so how does this all fit together? Because I've, 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 I've now pro probably exhausted and bored you. Um, hopefully not, but you know. Uh, all right, so how do we put all this together? Well, uh, everything that I've described so far goes under the sort of general umbrella term of microphysics, the equation of state, the nuclear reactions, the, uh, the weak interactions with neutrinos, um, that give you energy losses. Um, all of that, uh, we have a, a library of routines that are usable by more than just one code. And we're working on GPU acceleration for that, as I mentioned. And um, then there are, are two codes that we work on here. One is Maestro, which does three-dimensional low mock hydrodynamics. And the other is Castro, which does explicit hydrodynamics. And um, I'm for the sake of time, I'm not going to go into great detail on the difference between that, those two. But basically, the difference is that uh, explicit hydrodynamics is uh, can, is compressible hydro. So, uh, whereas low Mach hydrodynamics tries to approximate real compressible hydrodynamics by um, by filtering out sound waves from the system, but retaining your compressibility by introducing a uh, velocity constraint that depends on your equation of state, essentially. And so this analytically enforces hydrostatic equilibrium for, for low Mach hydro, and it lets you limit your time step by the advection velocity instead of the sound crossing time of cells. Um, I have some stuff in here on hybrid carbon oxygen neon white dwarfs. Um, but for the sake of time, I'm just going to skip some of that um, and show you so basically, this is another class of white dwarf that I was investigating, where um, it came from a more massive star, where carbon st started burning in the star to make, uh, to make neon 20, essentially. And then you're, that stopped. Um, then you're, that leaves you with a carbon oxygen neon white dwarf. This came from a stellar evolution prediction. And we wanted to know what would happen if that exploded. Um, this is a. Reaction. This is a, what comes out of a reaction network for a one-zone model of a shock called ZND, which I won't elaborate on. But um, it's very similar to the reaction network equation I showed, or integration I showed you earlier. It's supplemented by a kind of uh, parameterization or a model of how the shock works. But what you're looking at is how the composition changes as a function of the initial carbon mass fraction. So you start out with a carbon fraction of 0.5. Carbon here is in red. As your initial carbon fraction decreases and your initial neon 20 mass fraction increases in purple, um, you can look at how the uh, nucleosynthesis all the way up to iron uh, and nickel changes. And the answer is that the nucleosynthesis passed past essentially the oxygen burning to silicon part doesn't really change all that much. Um, so uh, this let us use a not too modified model 
of uh, of burning inside a carbon oxygen white dwarf to this carbon oxygen neon white dwarf. And so this is a typical explosion that came out of that study. Um, and the estimated amount of nickel 56 that's produced in a sampling of these uh, explosions is shown on the right, um, where we found that carbon oxygen and carbon oxygen neon white dwarfs gave comparable yields. What I'm currently working on is this. This is the ERCA process in white dwarfs, and you'll recognize those two weak uh, interaction reactions from the network that I mentioned earlier. The relevance of this to white dwarfs is that um, carbon 12 plus carbon 12 makes sodium 23. And you, and I, as I explained the, as I explained some of the dynamics of those reactions and their temperature and energy uh, sensitivities, uh, that's relevant to a, to a white dwarf because in the, the center of the white dwarf you have carbon 12 plus carbon 12 fusion going on as it uh, heats up and approaches thermonuclear runaway in the single degenerate paradigm. And um, that drives convection. And you have these weak er interactions occurring simultaneously. And so um, what you're looking at here is the, um, is the electron capture rate and the beta decay rate as a function of density. Uh, and this is the log rate. So electron capture is dominated at high densities. Beta decay is dominated at low densities. Yes. Ah, look, yes, the colors are different temperatures in the log, that's log temperature. Um, and this is a plot from the second MESA paper, uh, or the, no, the third MESA paper, um, where on the fly weak rates, weak rate evaluation was added. So, uh, yes, at high densities, at, so, yeah, so, yes, the way that, yeah, the way this works at high densities, the uh, electrons are highly degenerate. You have a high, en your Fermi energy is high enough that it's above the capture energy threshold. No, I understand the process. And, I'm just asking which ones are dotted. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Captures and decays. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. So anyway, um, this is one of the simulations that I've done so far. Uh, where all this black wiggly stuff is line integral convolution for a lot for velocity. So where, so in the core of the white dwarf, you're looking at a smooth flow that's convective, and then outside of that, it's not convective. Um, uh, I did this with YT. Visit might do that also. Yeah, these are line integral convolutions for the in-plane velocities in this slice. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know how new it is, but um, the colors come from energy, uh, gener the energy generation rate. Uh, purple is negative, the green is positive. So um, this, this should remind you of that plot I showed of, of temperature and energy generation uh, rate from the, from the same network, where um, when the carbon fusion went away, your energy generation was negative. In this case, we still have carbon fusion in the center. It's just not fast enough. To, um, to give you a positive energy generation rate. Um, all right, so this is kind of species gradients that we get out of this, where there is no convection here. Um, and yeah, I am uh, designing further simulations to, to look at what happens when convection interacts with this, basically. So this is in progress work. Um, so we can go back here. Yep. On that radius diagram, which tells where is the band of ERCA? Ah, yeah. Okay. So uh, this diagram, the uh, the ERCA shell is is this white circle where the energy generation rate is zero because the electron captures and beta decays are in equilibrium, uh, which roughly speaking is here. It's um, like How close to point four five. Sorry? How wide is it on that diagram? Oh, um, that is, you mean, you mean what length scale here? Show me where the band of ERCA is occurring. 
Ah, okay. Uh, I'm not, so I'm not sure about this, about where the, those bars would be on this plot. Um, you can see it's a very thin region. Yeah. Yeah, the convection is below that. You can still have an ERCA process even if you're not convective because there's a con there's an ERCA process there's a con and then there's a convective ERCA process. And Yes. 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 Well, but, but I mean, it would be, it would be how, how do you define, I mean, it would be someplace like this, right? It, yeah. I mean, how do you well, define I'm vertical water? I want to know what radius, you know, how No, that's what I'm saying. I mean, here's radius along here. Right. And the question is, how are you defining where it's happening? Because these things are essentially static. That's, that's the... I mean, yeah, like you get a factor of two over... Yeah. Yeah. But I think the point is you're not going to see all that much because it's it's not going in a cycle the way the convector works. It, it doesn't need to. You would see a spike. It doesn't need to because that's what happens in neutron stars during cooling. Yeah, I don't save a variable like neutrino luminosity. It's not the variable I even calculate. But I do calculate, I could look at the. Well, you know your rates that you captured in the neutrino luminosity is basically you're just going to look at the rate captured. Yep. If you plot the rate of capture there, I mean, basically, on that, you're going to see where the, the, that is, where that, where that piece is, the, you know, reaching around that point is occurring. Right. Right. <laughs> they just go poof and they disappear. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> but yes, I yeah, I can plot the I can plot the rates. It's um, So, 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 
it's an interesting point that we might not see convection if we don't resolve that well enough. Um, the, the spatial scale for the gridding here is 10 kilometers. Um, and yeah, so, uh, so yeah, this is 400 kilometers. Um, so over a couple hundred kilometers. There are probably, there are like, so there are 20 zones in, on a spatial scale of like this. Um, and I have some plots where I show the grids, but I didn't put those on in this presentation. Um, what I am planning is, uh, and what I've been trying to get working is uh, an adaptive mesh refinement criteria that will capture the region around the Urca shell effectively. Um, so far, I've been having issues getting the multigrid and maestro to converge for the, the mesh refinement that I've chosen, but that's in progress stuff. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm working on. I'm working on that. But yeah, I will keep in mind how well resolved it is. Um, and that's, that's about all I wanted to talk about, and I'm out of time. Um, so yeah, I think my computer froze again. So thank you for your attention. <laughs> oh, this is a well, this is a few slides back. Uh, we can watch it again. Why not? <laughs> oh yeah, the colors you're looking at here are. Um, progress variables that specify what degree of burning is happening. So white means no burning, red means you've burnt some carbon into a uh, loosely classified ash material. And then green indicates um, essentially uh, material is burning in a slow quasi-statistical equilibrium um, sense. And the composition is silicon and calcium. And Similarly, massed elements. Um, black indicates that we're in nuclear statistical equilibrium, so the composition is mostly um, helium and iron and nickel and elements around the iron peak. Um, anyway, all right. Are there any questions? I guess we did questions during the. But. <laughs> Chabrier, that's the C. I saw it here. Chabrier. Yes, I have. I, I I I saved that paper, but I didn't remember the name. Um, 